So, hello everyone, and thank you for coming to my talk. Uh, please note that this is more of a side project of mine and a bit of an experiment. I hope, however, that you will find some of what I'm going to present useful. So, in an era of ever-expanding research data and the need for reliable long-term preservation methods, I think it is important to explore novel approaches. A long-term research data preservation infrastructure refers to the systems and mechanisms in place to ensure the long-term sustainability and integrity of research data. So far, centralized uh, approaches to tackle this problem have been the norm, but they come with certain issues and trade-offs, which I will touch upon in the first part, part of this talk. I do believe that this the particular properties of different data storage architectures rely, relying on decentralized systems which have relatively recently emerged can provide an interesting alternative to current long-term research data preservation solution, solutions. I will try and show you why and briefly talk about our experience in trying to build a proof of concept that relies on these technologies and how we could get this moving forward. So, First, uh, what sort of research data would we like to preserve? I can co it can come in many shapes. It can be, for instance, textual, uh, text textual sources like manuscripts, books, archival materials such as documents, photographs, research data sets such as uh, annotated data sets for machine learning, model training, empirical data, surveys, experiments, etc. Linguistic data like corpora, uh, dictionaries, digital resources like websites, online publications, metadata and uh, contextual information, so information about the data being preserved itself, research documentation, and even intellectual property records like copyright information, uh, legal documentation, etc. So here are some of the main uh, solutions that currently exist for the long-term preservation of research data. A big famous one is Zenodo, right, which is picking up speed at the moment, which is a general purpose repository operated by CERN and allows researchers to upload and share any type of research output, like data sets, code, and publications. It provides features like persistent DOIs, versioning, etc. Another one is Dataverse, right, which is an open source web application that enables researchers to create their own data repositories. It offers data publishing, sharing, archiving uh, capabilities. And we also have a number of national and international archiving solutions, like uh, EUDAT, for example, or EUDAT, I'm not sure. Uh, uh, which is a collaborative European data infrastructure that offers data management uh, services, including long-term preservation. And when they say long-term, I guess they say at least 25 years, right? But, yeah. but uh, while centralized repositories offer many benefits, they also face certain challenges which can be summarized as follows. First is sustainability. They rely on consistent funding and institutional support to ensure the long-term sustainability. They are, deep, they are dependent on a single entity uh, or organization to maintain and operate the infrastructure. So if this entity faces fina financial, technical, or administrative challenges, it could impact the availability and accessibility of the data. Uh, there's issues regarding ownership and control. Uh, researchers and institutions may have concerns about relinquishing control and ownership of their data to a centralized repository. They may prefer to, uh, to maintain control of their, their data, which can be challenging in a centralized model where data is stored and managed by a third party. Uh, they need assurance that their data will be preserved, protected, and accessible in the long term. Any perceived lack of trust or reliability can hinder adoption and usage of their centralized repositories. In contrast, a decentralized data storage architecture offers a number of benefits. First is distribution. In a decentralized architecture, research data is distributed across multiple nodes or storage locations. Each node holds a totality or a portion of the data, ensuring redundancy and reducing the reliance on a single central storage system. Uh, redundancy and resilience, if one node fails uh, or experiences issues, uh, the data remains accessible from other nodes. Access and availability. Researchers can retrieve data from multiple nodes, reducing the risk of downtime or access restrictions associated with a single centralized storage system. O other benefits, there's a long list, right? I put it on two slides, that shows there's a lot. Okay, scalability and flexibility. As research data grows, new nodes can be added uh, to the network, expanding storage capacity. 
Trust and transparency, such architectures leverage cryptographic techniques and consensus mechanisms, providing increased trust and transparency. Data integrity can be verified by multiple nodes, ensuring the authenticity and immutability of the data. And finally, collaboration and interoperability. Different institutions or research projects can participate in the network, sharing and accessing data seamlessly. Uh, despite these benefits, uh, this new type of architecture also presents a number of challenges. Uh, the first one being ownership and access. Uh, storing research data on a public decentralized network may expose sensitive information to the public, requiring the implementation of additional uh, privacy measures, maintenance and incentivization, uh, which requires a special infrastructure, which could lead to uh, higher operational costs. Um, however, due, due to the actual nature of these networks, these operational costs can be funded or distributed in a number of flexible ways, which I will uh, show you a bit later. Uh, another issue could be regulatory and compliance consideration. If, uh, for instance, uh, you need to comply with uh, regulations we have in, in Europe, like GDPR, this might be a bit trickier in this, uh, if you were to adopt such an architecture. And finally, implementation complexity, which is a big one. Uh, uh, since it's a kind of a new implementation paradigm, uh, decentralized architectures based on decentralized ledger technology, for example, can introduce complexity in terms of understanding and implementing the underlying protocols and mechanisms. Uh, the tech evolves quickly and is not as settled as more traditional tech stacks like relational or graph databases, right? So we have explored these ideas for a while now, starting in 2019, and I've, I've tried to see how such a decentralized storage solution could be implemented in practice. Uh, we have therefore decided to build a very small proof of concept with the small, simple goal of implementing a simple use case, uh, the decentralized storage of indexable, acquirable, linked open data. So we even try to do away with the issues of data access and ownership, just to begin with, right? and see how easy it will be. So at the time, in 2019, we evaluated a number of technologies, such as something called the DAT protocol. I don't know if you've heard about it. Another one called Scuttlebot. And finally settled on something called Ethereum Swarm, which is linked to the Ethereum uh, blockchain, right? Um, our experience was not great, uh, as the tech at the time was not very fleshed out and very much in a prototypical state. Uh, issues regarding data ownership and indexing and retrieval became apparent very quickly and we ended up being quite stumped in our progress. A little later, another solution called OrbitDB, which is an abstraction layer on top of IPFS that behaves like a database, uh, looked quite promising as it offered solutions to our issues regarding data indexing in search. So basically the idea was to store uh, JSON-LD in this OrbitDB layer on, that on, sits on top of IPFS. A quick definition of IPFS for some of you who might not know what it is. Uh, it's, it works like treating data as, as blocks within a global distributed file system and use peer-to-peer -peer networking to locate and retrieve data based on cryptographic hashes. So it's data, instead of having a URI, for instance, it di is described by a hash of uh, the data itself, which actually has a number of properties that could be, again, interesting. Um, but it's quite a, a bit of a different paradigm from what is currently available, traditionally. Um, okay, so this is an overview of the four-layer design uh, we came up with originally. Oh, five minutes, okay. Yeah, okay, thank you. Uh, yeah, so yeah, uh, we come up with this kind of design, right? So on top you have a, a user interface, underneath an API layer. Uh, the UI, of course, commun uh, communicates with the API. At the bottom, we have the business logic, and at the bot very bottom, the, the data store itself. And the idea was, especially with this prototype, that since it's stored on IP, oh, since it's stored, whoa, <laughs> since it's stored on IPFS, you can store the whole thing on IPFS itself. So not only the, um, yeah, everything will be uh, decentralized, basically. And yeah, I mean, this is it running on my machine. Oh, sorry. This is it running on my machine, as you can see. I wanted to show you for real, but I don't know. You know how demo goes usually. Okay, so this was like the first and second prototype. Uh, it used the same, sorry, it used the same code roughly, but we, f we switched the, the data storage layer uh, with, to OrbitDB. Uh, 
And this was a bit better, but still we run into issues. And again, it was really like a bit of an experiment, right? Like a side project sort of thing. Uh, so these are the kind of issues we faced. Um, which, da, 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 yeah, we, we faced issue mostly with uh, data retrieval, basically in indexing. And what we wanted to do is make it Sparkle queryable, right? And to be able to query uh, in Sparkle data that is stored using JavaScript client code uh, that's stored in JSON LD in Sparkle, that was tricky. Uh, not to mention the issues uh, we will have with, uh, again, data ownership because everything on IPFS is public unless you own your, you run your own node, but yeah. But uh, main questions that came up with were uh, which models can we use to incentivize the storage or the running of the nodes? Who owns the data? How can we uh, represent ownership of the data and access of the data and how to query it? But first, uh, I want to like to talk quickly about incentivization because there's a lot of various models that can be adopted. Here, for instance, you could imagine a consortium of institutions volunteering to run nodes in the model of the Bloxberg blockchain that you might have, might have heard of, which is the first global blockchain consortium initiative. We focus on research and academic application, which was spearheaded by the Max Planck Digital Library, but I think now it's more of an actual consortium. It's the biggest proof of authority network in the world, apparently. So each node, yeah, uh, is hosted by an institution. Uh, but another option would be to delegate the running of the nodes to the decentralized network itself, where individuals are monetarily incentivized to run nodes and host data. This is the model used by networks such as uh, Filecoin, right, which is a way to incentivize storage on IPFS using this kind of, uh, using a token, right, that represents uh, actual value. And there's a number of uh, competing solutions to this uh, coming up. Some are called Arweave, another one, Storgy. I mean, it's a very rapidly evolving field, and the question is, okay, which one are going to last in the very long term, which is the whole goal of this, right? So I guess it's more of a wait and see thing at this stage, at least. Uh, but uh, an, a last one that I would like to, uh, we, we're trying to use at the moment is this one called Ori Origin 12. So the way it works is each node um, runs an instance of Blaze Graph and um, it's basically a decentralized knowledge graph which comes up, which comes with a lot of benefits. It's a Sparkle queryable right from the, from the beginning, what do you say, uh, inherently. And um, data ownership and access is represented by uh, NFTs. Uh, made available to, uh, on a number of various blockchains, uh, which you can see here, like Ethereum, quite a few of them. So this is something we might be thinking about having a look at next. But then, you know, we were wondering, maybe this is a bit of a wild goose chase. Perfect. Uh, because, I mean, when you look at Zenodo, for example, right, uh, maybe it would be just be a matter of switching the bottom layer, the data storage layer of Zenodo, and distribute this. To not, so as to not disrupt the current user experience that researchers have when they want to store research data, basically. Um, yeah, the technology evolves very quickly. So, yeah, maybe it's a, again, we need to wait a little bit uh, before really starting to consider this seriously. But I'm wondering if, in any case, it's something we're going to have to do, you know, if we really want to preserve data for 100, 200 years, because I assume that some of these networks, due to the fact that they're incentivized, uh, might last very long. So that's roughly it, yeah? Thank you very much.